everyone, Ryan Young, Kama Jiu Jitsu. I've got a seminar for you. A lot of you've been asking where or how can you learn from Kama Jiu Jitsu? Well, you can go to one of our seminars and the next one happens to be Saturday, November 11th. It's coming up quick. It's gonna be over at uh, Delaware Jiu Jitsu, which is actually in Chad's Ford, Pennsylvania. And it's run by Professor Joe Goldberg. Give him a call and reserve your spot. It's not a big studio, it's not a big venue. It's gonna run out quick. It's the third or fourth time Professor Dave will be there teaching. So I guarantee you're gonna love this one. You're gonna learn the invisible jiu-jitsu that we do here at Common Jiu-Jitsu. But anyway, give Professor Joel a call and we'll get it started for you. Take care, bye-bye. Hey everyone, Ryan Young, Kama Jiu Jitsu. Today I wanted to hit a controversial topic once again. There are two different types of Jiu Jitsu today. And how do I know this? Well, you know, I, I did start a while ago, as did Professor Dave, Professor Fernando, Professor Jack. All of Kama Jiu Jitsu's black belts started decades ago, at least two. Uh, and Professor Dave at least three. When we were learning Gracie Jiu Jitsu, it was taught really by Elio's sons. You know, you, you did have the Machados teaching, you did have uh, Pedro Sauer was out here for a little while, but really it was, it was pretty, it was pretty small, the universe of people that, that could teach Gracie Jiu Jitsu out here at that time. Whereas now, there are tons of black belts. You got black belts who are given honorary black belts, right? Wasn't there a UFC fighter who got a black belt because he could smash the crap out of a particular Gracie? So what does he do? Because the guy smashes him, oh here, let me give you a black belt, right? So all of a sudden now he's a black belt in Gracie Jiu Jitsu because he got a belt from the source, you know, a family member. You know, and then you have, let's say you have people like this guy who, this UFC fighter, you know, I'm not trying to diminish anything he's done because, you know, he's a UFC fighter. But he now has a black belt in Gracie Jiu Jitsu, even though he hasn't trained in Gracie Jiu Jitsu. What happens now? So if he decides he wants to teach some people, he's got some students that, that were training under him, and he decides he wants to give out belts. Now, is he legitimate? Because he got his black belt from a Gracie family member, so you could make a contention that he's a legitimate Gracie Jiu Jitsu black belt and now he's giving them out, even though he never trained Gracie Jiu Jitsu. So he, his grappling is phenomenal, but it's not Gracie Jiu Jitsu. So you have a lot of this going on right now. Not only him, but you have people who receive black belts, even though they don't know how to get out of a headlock escape. You know, people say, well, no, that's the self-defense portion. People can learn that anytime. You can learn anything anytime. You know, I have a student who's been with me for over a year now, and he he was under a jiu-jitsu black belt a bjj black belt and he'd been training for six years earned a purple belt and when he found us came to us and i you know through our conversation we're talking he was looking to make a change because his school had shut down and he was looking for a new home so we're talking i turned out yeah you're six years so let me guess you're a purple belt he says yeah i said okay good so we'll see you tonight and um, he goes, oh, but if you don't mind, I'm gonna come, I'm gonna wear a white belt. And I said, you know, you don't need to do that. I mean, you earned a purple belt, you know, wear, wear your purple belt. So he comes to the studio, he brings his white belt. And I said, why are you doing this, right? And he says, well, I, I like to think that the jujitsu you do and the, the jujitsu I learned are two different arts. Sure enough, when he was training with us that day, it was, it was pretty obvious that his jujitsu knowledge was different than the jujitsu knowledge that we teach here. So I still told him at the end of class, I said, you know what, I'll get you a certain purple belt that we offer to people who earned rank in other schools. And this purple belt just simply had a white bar at the end of it instead of the, the traditional black bar on the end of the belt, uh, the bar that you put the stripes on, right? So I was just going to give him one that we issued to people who earn rank at other schools until they earn the rank, that equivalent rank at our school, in which point we'll then replace the belt with a traditional purple belt in this case and he said no 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 I'm just going to wear the white belt because like I said like I told you it's a different art and I'm just going to treat this as a different art and I'm like okay that, that's fine you know I'm not going to argue with him over that that's that's not something I care to argue about because it's not that big a deal to me you know he wasn't the only one we had a blue belt from um from another school an affiliate of a of a, of a, of a master came in uh, and he he wore 
the blue belt with the white bar on it. Uh, for it wasn't very long. I mean, he picked up our system very quickly, and um, he's now one of our, our junior instructors, and he's uh, a very good one at that. You know, here's the way I look at it. Uh, Maeda took judo from Kano, from the Kodokan, and he changed it to suit his needs when he was uh, prize fighting, right? Because um, maybe the particular judo that he was doing maybe were, was missing some, some important pieces that he needed to deal with catch wrestlers, for instance. I, I don't know. Um, so maybe Maeda might have modified his judo sum to create Maeda judo, which he then taught to Carlos, Carlos Sr. Carlos Sr. then uh, took that Maeda judo, or as they called it, jujitsu then, and made some changes to it, as did Elio and, and Halls, and you know, all the family members made their significant contributions to Gracie Jiu Jitsu. It's not like saying Gracie Jiu Jitsu is the same as Kano Judo, right? The traditional Judo. It's not. You know, I can't expect, for, for example, being a black belt in, in, in Jiu Jitsu, to be able to walk into a Judo studio wearing my black belt, saying I'm a black belt in Judo, because although they came from the same art, they're not the same art. You know, if I walk into a judo studio, I wear a white belt. That's the respect I need to show the sensei because it's a different art. Granted, there's some overlap in it, and a lot of what Gracie Jiu Jitsu does, judo does, and vice versa. But the mentality is different. The goals are different. And therefore, the art is different. Grappling is grappling, yes. But does that mean that you know, a collegiate wrestler would come into uh, a Kama Jiu Jitsu studio and, you know, and let's say he was an NCAA champion. Would that make him a black belt in Gracie Jiu Jitsu because he can grapple? No, right? Like I said, there's overlap, but it's not the same thing. So somebody like this wrestler may be on the fast track to learning Gracie Jiu Jitsu, right? He may pick it up a lot quicker than somebody who's, who's coming in from having no experience in any kind of grappling martial art, right? Fast forward to today, you have BJJ and Gracie Jiu Jitsu. A lot of people who do BJJ like to say Jiu Jitsu is Jiu Jitsu. At one point, I would say it was, right? Back in the 90s, yes. Because the, the people who taught it was a very, there was a small select group of people. And even if you think about the black belts that came out of that, they were what I would see is the old school hardcore guys who really tried to do their masters in honor by trying to keep jujitsu as pure as possible. And I think that's largely the case for the original Dirty Dozen. You know, the ones who earned their black belts the first. They tend to be more traditional because when they learned it and when they were excelling at it, when they were moving up the ranks, there was no MMA. There was just Gracie Jiu Jitsu. And you had within Gracie Jiu Jitsu the self defense, you had the gi, and the no gi stuff was the Valley Tudo. And those are all components of Gracie Jiu Jitsu. However, with the popularity of the UFC, namely post Horian Gracie UFC, you had all these regulations that came in, right? John McCain, remember him? Human cockfighting, then and, and calling for regulation of, of mixed martial arts, or, you know, what was termed, I guess, mixed martial arts back then, or the UFC. So as a result, Hori and Grace just got out of it, said, I ah, forget this, I'm not going to do this. It ruins the whole premise of what I'm doing here. So in comes Dana White, and what he does is he gets, I guess, legalized with all the boxing commissions. But now there are rules, and now we have the modern mixed martial arts, right? And it's a sport. I mean, there are, there are rules involved. You can't, um, you know, you can't soccer kick a guy when he's down on all fours. Right, as, as you would see in a street fight. Granted, these guys are tremendous athletes and I would, I would put my money on any of them. Uh, you know, to me, they all can fight, but is what they're engaging in the equivalent of a fight sometimes? If you have a guy, all he wants to do is just take people down, take people down for, for points, and he wins rounds by, being, by taking somebody down and then getting right back up, is it a fight? No. What I've been seeing a lot is, you know, I, I've got some some people that you know come to the studio and they've been training under a BJJ professor, and they they do things that we we don't do. For instance, when you we start standing up, um, especially for the kids, uh, and the reason why we have the kids do it is because kids are a lot more resilient. Uh, they can do throws and lands and all that um, because their bodies are lighter. Uh, there, there's not as much physical damage to 
an 80 pound kid um, or a 60 pound kid getting thrown versus a 280 pound man getting thrown. Now the 280 pound man lands wrong, you know, that could be a dislocated shoulder um, or it could be his neck getting tweaked or, you know, and, and I've seen a lot of this happen. So with the adults, we really have to watch um, to what extent we do um, hard throws. So with most schools though, that's not the reason why they, they start on their knees. The reason why most schools start on their knees is because they compete. When you compete, there's no throwing going on. Very little. And when, when competition was first started, you, you had two options. If you sat down and pulled guard, you could get penalized by your opponent given, given the two points for a takedown, or the ref could simply say, well, um, you, you lost an advantage. So the one who didn't sit down on his butt to pull guard, he got an advantage. So that if the match ended up being at a 0-0 tie, the one who didn't pull guard would win. Today, there is no penalty for pulling guard. There's no negative advantage, there's no, two, there's no negative two points, none of that kind of stuff happens if you pull guard. So the rules of Jiu Jitsu, BJJ, have really set it so that there's no need to, to do any throws or, or any takedowns. Because if you do a takedown, you'll get two points, but it takes a lot of energy to do it. And why? Just sit down. Just sit down and let's, let's, get, let's get busy on the ground, right? So on the other hand, if you look at judo, judo, there really is no incentive to grapple because all the points, or well, rather you win by one, by a single point, that single point comes from a beautiful throw in which your opponent lands flat on their back. Now, you could end up with a messy throw where you only get a half point or a quarter point. So you have to get the, the next half of your point by simply pinning your opponent down and just making sure they don't get up. So if you can pin them so they don't get up, you get that extra half point and you win the match. The last option would be to actually submit somebody, and that's judo. So if you, if you create an environment like with judo where really the way to win quickly the equivalent of a submission is to just throw a nice, do a nice throw, then that's what they're gonna spend 90% of their time working for, a beautiful throw. In jiu-jitsu, if you know, the submission is, is, is kind of difficult because people, everybody's defense has gotten, gotten good, everybody's athletic now, so they have explosive ability, and they're, they're, the, the match is five or six minutes, it's pretty short. It really comes down to little advantages sometimes, right? If you can get a little advantage here or there, or if you get a point here or there, then you can take that all the way to the end of the match and win it. If you no longer have an advantage point being awarded to your opponent for you sitting down in guard, then sit down in guard all you want. There's no penalty for it. So it makes sense that somebody who runs a school is gonna tell his students, don't even waste time trying to practice throws and takedowns because number one, you're only gonna get two points for it. And number two, it's easier just to sit down because if you just sit down, then you'll still be at zero, zero with no advantages going either way. On the other hand, in a fight, it is valuable to know how to take somebody down, right? We have some kids that came in and they're not familiar with takedowns. Their guards were very good. But if they're not playing guard or even taking a back, I, I forget, their, their back attacks are pretty good. If they're not taking the back or not playing guard, then there wasn't really much else to their game. Their instructor did not teach them how to deal with headlocks. You know, they came to a class and we did, um, what, maybe four different variations of a headlock and how to get out of them. Uh, they learned one of them. They did it maybe once or twice and really that was it. They, they never came back to it again. I think it's really an instructor just trying to do what little he needs to do on the self-defense side to give somebody the, the feeling that they're teaching the kids self-defense or the adults for that matter but if their if their primary goal is competition it doesn't make any sense for them to waste any time doing self-defense doing takedowns because it's a much better use of your time resource to spend it on mat work and if your classes are only 50 minutes to an hour you want to put as much time into that mat work as you can so it's not uncommon to see maybe 10 or 15 minutes of of instruction of a sequence of a submission and then have them go and work on it for the next 10 minutes and then have them train for the next 30 or 35 minutes I just want to make sure that you all know so let's say you're you're taking your kids to jiu-jitsu or BJJ or Gracie jiu-jitsu and and the primary reason for you taking your kid there is for self-defense 
then you need to ask the instructor how much of your time is spent preparing for competitions. You could also ask them how many times a month do they typically enter tournaments. If it's once a month, then you know they're spending the entire month prior preparing for a tournament. There's no time to do takedowns, there's no time to do base, there's no time to do self-defense. Being that they're so prolific in competition, they're going to be focusing on com competitive techniques. Not that there's anything wrong with it, it's just that you as a parent or you as an individual looking for a school need to know what you're getting into. Are you joining a school? Are you looking for jiu-jitsu because you want to do self-defense? Or are you looking for jiu-jitsu because you, you like the feeling of competing and, and, and you want your child to, to feel the pressures of competing and, and that kind of stuff, right? Uh, because if you think about it, you know, look at football. You know, here in Texas, football is huge. So every kid plays football. Football is a violent sport. You know, there's a lot of, you know, there's tackling, there's, there's crashing into somebody, there's, there's running full speed and just jamming your shoulder to the face and knock them down. You know, you, you're doing, you're, you're cutting out the legs and all that. So it's a violent sport. But do you enroll your kid in a club football program thinking that they're learning how to fight? No, you're, you're enrolling them so they can play football. Same with soccer. Soccer, you know, they kick. You know, the, you know if, if you kick a soccer ball and you kick it across a field and you were to kick somebody with that same kick, you'd hurt them. But do people enroll their kids in soccer for self-defense? No. So my contention is that today, people who enroll their kids in BJJ need to come in with the thinking that they're in, entering their kids into a sport and they're looking to get their kids exposure to the sportive aspects of jiu-jitsu without the thought that it's really self-defense because it's not being taught that way you know kids don't know how to break fall well they can't break fall front can't break fall back uh, they don't know the basic movements of jiu-jitsu they don't know how to how to do an up kick they don't know how to close a distance they don't know how to parry punches. You don't learn this kind of stuff in BJJ because there's none of that in a tournament. There's no striking. There's no, um, you know, there's there's legal and illegal moves. So what's going to happen is in, in, a, in a class, you're going to cater to the legal moves and you're going to ignore the illegal moves. Well, an illegal move can be as simple thing as a slam. You know, pick the kid up and slam him down on the ground. If they're well-versed in self-defense, they know it's a possibility and they're taught to deal with it and if the situation arises where they could be slammed they stop doing what the behavior that would cause them to be slammed in a tournament setting though it's illegal to slam you so you're going to do the behavior that may not be such a good behavior to have in a fight because in a tournament nobody's going to slam you anyway oh well the assumption is of course accidents do happen and that's where a lot of tragic things occur because you might have one kid who's taught as a takedown to just run up to your opponent and jump guard on him you know do the old koala bear hug and the second kid who's getting the opponent jumped onto him may be thinking to himself um, oh what is this this is a gift let me slam the kid because he might not have been fully briefed on the rules of jiu-jitsu and what's legal and illegal Right? A lot of times, you know, and I've seen it happen, there's a video of a kid who might have been 10 years, uh, maybe 10, 8 to 10, two kids, it was a tournament, one kid went and jumped and did the old koala bear jump on the other kid, the other kid just went, huh, and slammed him, boom, knocked the kid out, and yes, he got disqualified, and, you know, parents were all up in arms about that, you know, yeah, he, he got disqualified qualified from the match, um, it should have been worse, um, you know, he should have been disqualified from competing and his, his instructor should have been sanctioned and all this kind of stuff. And, and then, you know, then it just kind of begs the question, okay, so your kid is doing jujitsu and jujitsu is self-defense, or is it? It's self-defense, so it's inherently dangerous and your kid didn't defend himself. Well, no, but, uh, you know, my, my kid's professor uh, tells him that it's okay to do that. Well, then it's not the other kid's fault. It's the fault of the instructor for telling your kid that it's okay to do that and assuming that the person is going to not violate the rules. Look at it in a real life situation. When you're driving on a two lane highway, right? One direction going one way and one direction going the other way. What separates one car from another from, from hitting each other in a head on crash? It's that yellow line in between the two lanes, correct? What is keeping 
one car from crashing into the other car. It's simply the fact that it's a law that you need to stay on the right side of the road, or I guess in Great Britain and Japan, it'd be the left side of the road, right? Um, you need to be on the right side of the road. You need to stay on your side, but really there's nothing really separating you and stopping you from going head on into an oncoming car, except a simple line. Same thing in jujitsu. There's nothing that says you're not going to get slammed when you do something like that, except for the rule book, that yellow line, that yellow line in jujitsu, right? But accidents happen. Sometimes somebody's not paying attention, they're texting on the, on, they're texting on the, on the, on the drive, or they fall asleep, or they're drunk. They cross that center line, and you have a tragic accident. The same thing happens in jujitsu, right? There's a tragic accident that happens when one kid doesn't either, either he's ignorant of the rule, or he just doesn't follow the rule. So parents, just make sure your eyes are open and individuals who, adults who go to a school to learn, make sure your eyes are open and find out what exactly you're learning. Are you learning self-defense or are you learning competition? Because today there is a difference between the two. And there ne- the difference is neither good nor bad. It, it just exists. What's bad is when people who run a school concentrating on the sports side tell their customers, tell their students, that they're in fact learning self-defense. You're not. There are competition schools that do teach self-defense concepts and there are self-defense schools, and I put these in quotes, there are self-defense schools that do competition concepts. In fact, there are some so-called self-defense lineage schools that do only competition, right? I've seen them happen, you know, where I walk in, I say, I choose that particular school. I'm, I'm traveling, I'm out of town. I wanna drop in, take a class. So I I look through the the phone book and I go, okay, that school comes out of this master. This school comes out of that master. Um, Let me go to to that first school because it comes out of a legit old school self-defense master. And I go to that school and nobody does self-defense in there. Nobody, not one at all. And in fact, I remember going to one particular school. I don't want to name what city it was, but um, I, I, I go to train with this other black belt. You know, we, we slap hands, and next thing you know, he starts twirling on me. He's, he, he, he sits on his, he does that inverted guard thing, he's twirling, and he's, and I just step back, and I'm looking at that, and I'm going, what the heck is this? Um, uh, and I'm like, okay, this, this is a competition school, it's not, it's not a self-defense school. But anyway, kind of went long on this, buyer beware. If you want to learn competition, combat jiu-jitsu is not it. Um, I don't even know the rules. I kind of know. I mean, I know that you can't slam somebody, right? I know you can't neck crank somebody either. Um, And I know that they have limits on foot locks and heel hooks and knee bars and all that kind of stuff. Um, But I don't know what the points are. I have no idea what it is. So I'd be a horrible competition teacher. But that's not to say that what we teach doesn't work well in competition. It does. Um, However, if you're going to another school and you want to learn self-defense, make sure they teach self-defense. Well, that's all I got for you. I'm about to run in and teach kids class today so i wish you all the best and happy training take care bye-bye